Welcome to our Annenberg Research Seminar today. We are delighted to have uh, Michael Schutzen with us uh, from the University of California at San Diego. Uh, Michael knows us better than uh, most uh, of our guests, as he was a member of the uh, review committee that we had, the external review committee for the, uh, the school a, a year ago, I guess it would have been then. So he knows, he knows all the facts and figures and details, but in addition to that, he's also a good friend to a number of us here at the school, not only at the Annenberg School, but in sociology and other places as well. So we're delighted to have him here. Michael did his uh, undergraduate work at Swarthmore and his doctoral work at Harvard. He's taught at the University of Chicago and for the last, you were commiserating, uh, almost 30 years, he's been at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, I came to USC just a couple years after, after he went there, so we've both been out here in California for, for quite a while now. Uh, Michael's the author of uh, six books and co-editor of, of a couple of others. He's received a number of honors and awards in his lifetime. He's had a Guggenheim Fellow. He's had a residential fellowship at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences in Palo Alto at Stanford. And he's the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award. Uh, so uh, we're really pleased to have you here with us today and to be able to share your thoughts with us about toward a cultural history of public disclosure from the 1950s to the present. And I think you're going to talk more about the 50s through the 80s. Right. Concentrate on that in that segment of time. So let's put your hands together for Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, my many friends in this room. Uh, I'm glad to see. Uh, the, um, what I want to present to you today is more in the way of a research proposal than the report of a research project. Um, I, I say that with a little embarrassment because I've been working on it for four years and it's still at the proposal level. But, um, but it means it's a moment at which, uh, if I manage to get through this fast enough, you can help me. <laughs> Um, you, you can reject the, the premises here, you can applaud them, you can suggest, at, either would help, uh, uh, you, you can suggest added chapters that I haven't thought of yet, um, you can suggest various complications in the, the general propositions. Um, I, I should say uh, in, initially, although I'm not going to say much about this in the talk, that I don't think all trends toward openness, frankness, and disclosure are necessarily all to the good, although I think on the whole they're to the good. Um, uh, but I recognize that there are complications about disclosure. Um, I'm going to go back and forth between new forms of disclosure in, in government, in personal life, and in professional life as well, professional meaning particularly doctor-patient relations. Um, I'm going to talk about things that I could put under the category of, um, of revealing when one person or institution tells the public about something discreditable about some other in individual or institution, that's revealing. Uh, disclosing where, where someone voluntarily provides information to the public that might be discrediting. Um, and accounting, uh, which is a more routinized, rationalized uh, uh, form of public disclosure, sometimes discrediting, sometimes not. Uh, all, all of that, I mean, and, and the, the, the premise which you are free to reject or tell me is, is absurd is that all of this is related. All of these things are related um, one to the next. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. The, the form of what I'm about to say in the next 30 or 40 minutes is a list, basically. Um, and the list I'm going to focus on uh, is, as Peter said, mostly stuff that happened between 1965 and 1980. Um, I, I organize it that way partly for the sake of my own 
students who say, oh, um, open this disclosure, you mean the internet. Well, I do mean the internet, yes, but I mean also all these things that preceded it and probably helped made the inter make the internet or the nature of it what it is today. Um, so let, let me uh, begin the list um, with one that I find quite intriguing, uh, which is the, the rise of the inspector general. Um, let me take the case of national security letters. Um, various statutes in the 1970s enabled the FBI uh, to obtain private records without a court order or without court review. Um, telephone records, internet communication records, bank records, and so on. Um, and, uh, and yet those, those, that legislation allowed the FBI to get this information only if the FBI had specific reason to think that the entity whose records were being sought was a foreign power or agent of a foreign power. And only a very few senior FBI officials could issue a national security letter. The Patriot Act in 2001 broadened this, the powers of the FBI in this regard greatly. Many more officials within the FBI could issue the letters. The information sought no longer needed to relate to a foreign power. And the threshold for seeking the information was only that it be relevant to an investigation of international terrorism or espionage. So then what happened with this additional power at the FBI? Well, um, the FBI abused the power many times. Uh, how do I know that? How do we know that? Um, because the FBI inspector, the Department of Justice Inspector General, Glenn Fine, issued a report, public report, to the President, to the Congress, and through the news media to the general public that documented the abuses. And he submitted that report um, and it became public in March 2007. At that point, the Electronic Frontier Foundation filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit seeking further information on FBI misuse of the National Security Letter Authority. A federal judge ordered the FBI to release information responsive to the EFF's request. In July 2007, the FBI disclosed a first batch of 1,100 pages to the EFF, all of which you can find at their website. These disclosures showed, among other things, that several cases of abuse of the national security letter power that the FBI itself documented were forwarded to the Intelligence Oversight Board, an executive agency established in 1981, following an order of President Ford. These cases also were forwarded to Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez, although Gonzalez had denied any knowledge of any civil liberties violation arising from the Patriot Act. Okay. And, and there's more uh, about that. But the question here is, what the hell is an inspector general? And where did the inspector general come from? Well, there are 62, at last time I looked, 62 inspectors general. They employ 12,000 members of the staff. And their job is to investigate the agencies to which they are assigned to 62 different federal agencies. Um, usually the inspector general is looking for waste and fraud and other financial mismanagement. Sometimes their efforts are far more extensive. Inspector General Fine at the Department of Justice worked with a staff of 400 criminal investigators, auditors, and lawyers. Um, and, and what gave the inspector general authority? Um, an act of 1978. This does not go back to George Washington. This does not go back to Franklin Roosevelt. It goes back to Jimmy Carter and one of a series of post-Watergate developments. Um, just because I happen to have it with me. Um, a couple other Inspector General reports in, the, in 2008. Um, this is page one of the New York Times, Iraq spending ignored rules, Pentagon says. That is, the Pentagon Inspector General says. A Pentagon audit of $8 billion in American taxpayer money spent by the U.S. Army on contractors in Iraq has found that almost none of the payments followed federal rules and that in some cases contracts worth millions of dollars were paid for despite little or no record of what, if anything, was received. 
Um, that's, that's the Department of Defense Inspector General. Um, I guess my favorite is December 14th. Um, official hist page one, New York Times. Official history spotlights Iraq rebuilding blunders. An unpublished 513-page federal history of the American-led reconstruction of Iraq depicts an effort crippled before the invasion by Pentagon planners who were hostile to the idea of building, rebuilding a foreign country and then molded it into a $100 billion failure by bureaucratic turf wars, spiraling violence, and ignorance of the basic elements of Iraqi society and infrastructure. Um, the, that report came from a, an, a special inspector general for Iraq reconstruction, um, which is to say someone appointed by President Bush, a, a Republican lawyer. That's, that's the report he wrote. And that more recently, Frank Rich said, was as important a document as the Pentagon Papers. And why have we ignored that? Um, which is probably a good question. Um, at, at any rate, this is what I would call executive self-surveillance. It's not the Congress looking at the executive. It's not the judiciary looking at the executive. It's not the, the media looking at the executive. It's the executive looking at the executive, and it is a force for disclosure that didn't exist before 1978. Um, you heard another feature um, in, in what I just presented. That's the Freedom of Information Act. Um, originally passed 1966, but made reasonably effective, as effective as uh, uh, for the first time when it was amended in 1974. So here's another agent or agency or mechanism of public disclosure that simply wasn't available in American life before the 1970s. Uh, in 2006, in response to a FOIA request from, from the AP, the Defense Department released some 5,000 pages of transcripts of information concerning the detainees at Guantanamo. I, at about that time, I was at a conference of FOIA officers and a few journalists, all members of the American Society of Access Professionals, which you see that in front of you, that's ASAP, <laughs> which is not very accurate about uh, FOIA requests or responses to them. However, it, it does in fact represent um, uh, the aspiration of at least this large group of FOIA officers. Um, as several people at the conference noted, nobody grows up intending to be a FOIA officer. Uh, <laughs> they, um, but uh, th this was also a kind of cheerleading um, session. We have a job that matters, said ASAP President Fred Sadler. And a veteran FOIA officer for the Department of the Navy called attention to the law's wide applicability. It can be used by any person for any reason, she reminded everyone, and said, that's a pretty good indication that we're a democracy, isn't it? And concluded, I love FOIA. Uh, I, actually, I do too, uh, myself. And I wonder why my imagination had been so uh, constricted that for so long, I believe that journalists and historians have to absolutely twist arms to get the government to respond to FOIA requests, although sometimes that's what they do have to do. Um, I imagine nameless and faceless bureaucrats uh, doing everything in their power to withhold information. Um, and those people probably exist uh, and see people requesting information as annoyances, just as there are professors, none of us here, who see students as an imposition on our precious time. Uh, but the FOIA officers I met wanted to do their job. And what they were told their job was, was loyalty to the law, not to the agency they were working within. And loyalty to the law meant releasing as much information as you possibly can consistent with the nine exemptions in the law, national security, personal privacy, uh, pre-decisional uh, pre deliberation, and various others. Um, so it's a complicated job, and it's, um, it's, it's obviously more art than science to know uh, what to release. Uh, the, someone at the National Security Archive showed me um, they made the same request to the State Department twice. Um, and they had them framed, the, the responses, 
next to each other. And if you read the two together, you get almost everything on this page. Uh, and, you know, there were a couple things still blacked out. But they, the two different FOIA officers blacked out different parts of the page. Anyway, there's some 5,000 FOIA officers in the government. In 2005, the Department of Defense processed 79,000 requests, costing them, for, costing them us, uh, $48 million. Overall, the government spends more than $350 million a year uh, answering FOIA requests. And these people, the ASAP uh, meeting, referred to those of you who send in FOIA requests as the requester community. Um, uh, and you know, felt like they, their job was to provide better customer service. OK. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, oh, the, while I'm on government disclosure, um, I thought as, as long as I was coming to Annenberg, um, I, I would find out what, um, who and how, who Dean Wilson um, uh, sent in campaign contributions to this year and how much. I added Dean Cowan uh, 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 <laughs> as well. Um, and um, I'm not going to reveal it, but, um, but you can find out too by going to op open, opensecrets.org. Uh, just r write in their name and, and you have it. Where, did, where does that come from? Well, the, the convenience of it comes from the internet and, and nonprofits like opensecrets.org that make the information available. But where did they get the information? From the Federal Elections Campaign Act of 1971 and 1974. People tried to make campaign contributions publicly available from Teddy Roosevelt's day on. Um, no campaign reform act did anything whatsoever until 1971 and 1974. Now, I mean, we have still plenty of reason to complain about the, uh, the amount of money we put into uh, our, our political campaigns. But at least we can find out uh, what it is. And the press, of course, reports this uh, quite avidly. It's easily available. It's quantitative. It's discrediting, um, and uh, it's what could be better. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. And, it's, um, and there's, there's a couple of good research papers that show, I think, I mean, to my satisfaction, that the press is, um, makes a mistake about all of this because, because they do think it's discrediting. Um, they, they, they do think that any sign that you received money from anyone is a sign that you've been bought. Um, and that goes too far. But, uh, and that's the implication that's left by a lot of the media reporting. But, but is it good that this is available? And, that, and is it, from my point of view, uh, in just compiling the list, is it relatively new? Yes. Yes, we are a more open government in that way than we ever, be, if you put these all together, Freedom of Information Act, FICA, uh, and, and the Inspector Generals, you know, from the 1970s on, we've been more open than at any point before. That, there's more to say about that. But let, let me come back to the, my list here. Um, the list, that, so that's three items on the list. Um, a fourth item, the National Environmental Policy Act, 1969. If you, if you read it, it seems very boring. It's, um, it's just a statement that the federal government should take an in interest in the environment, basically. It's a kind of general policy statement. Um, uh, environmental impact, the phrase is important, um, is, should be a concern of federal policy making. That was the beginning of the environmental impact statements. And that was the beginning of public hearings related to any federal project, um, you know, a construction project that might have any sort of impact uh, uh, on the environment, uh, the, uh, giving, giving rise to a whole other layer of bureaucracy, of course, uh, giving rise to a joke uh, 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 about um, God and Moses um, at the edge of the Red Sea in a very critical moment. Uh, and um, uh, Moses said, you know, could you do something? <laughs> Here, we, we, the, I see the pharaoh, he's coming. Um, 
And uh, God says, yeah, but uh, we're going to have to make a deal. Um, uh, I'll part the Red Sea, okay? Ah, great, that'll be great. But you have to write the envi environmental impact report. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was a big change. Again, making public, making publicly available and urging the public to contribute to uh, talking about the impact of government action on the environment. Um, the Stonewall Riots, 1969 signaled and stimulated a new openness about homosexuality and was sort of the kind of the, the er moment um, of, of gay and lesbian liberation. Reform efforts in the Congress, 1970 to 1975, um, reduced secrecy in congressional proceedings. The you know, Freedom of Information Act, as you know, um, applies only to the executive. Um, Congress loved it for obvious reasons. And uh, congressional activity was exempt, as is judicial act activity, from um, uh, FOIA requests. But um, Congress voluntarily uh, began to open more, eventually most of its committee hearings to the public, stopped uh, taking votes that went unrecorded. I should have brought, I thought I had what the Constitution says about transparency. Uh, uh, almost nothing. But, uh, but there is a clause, I, I won't get this word for word, but it's, it's close, that, that the, both houses of Congress should keep a record of proceedings and make it public from time to time. Um, and that should include, upon a vote of at least 20% of the Congress, the yeas and nays on particular acts. So, I mean, um, except when there's also an accept clause, the, the Congress decides that secrecy is required. Okay, so that, that, that's pretty much all the Constitution says about uh, openness in congressional government. There, there were big, big changes, big reforms in the Congress in the early 70s that, that made a difference. Um, 1969, uh, again, big year, Elizabeth Kuhler Ross published On Death and Dying based on the premise that physicians and caretakers should be frank with dying patients. Um, not her book specifically, although it, it, it did have an influence, but um, there is surprisingly interesting data on, on this. Uh, uh, surveys of oncologists in 1961 and resurvey uh, with the, basically the same questions in 1979, so an 18-year gap. 1961, it was 12% um, of physicians who said they would tell their terminal patients that they were dying, 12%. 1979, it's 98%. I mean, so the, uh, it, it's so startling, you figure there has to be something wrong with this data, but... <laughs> But something remarkable <coughs> happened in this period. Um, now, both surveys, uh, this, another little interesting piece, said, how do you come to your decision about what to do uh, in talking to your dying patients? Um, in 1961, the leading answer to that was uh, clinical practice. Um, you know, not, not anything I've read, not anything I was taught in medical school, but clinical practice teaches me that I shouldn't tell them. 1979, what did they answer? <coughs> Clinical practice, right. Um, <laughs> why? Now, um, well, because that's what doctors usually answer, I guess. Um, uh, and maybe it was correct. I don't know. Um, but that is maybe patients by 1979 had come to expect a level of frankness that they didn't expect and didn't want in 1961. Or maybe it was more at the elite level, maybe the atmosphere um, among medical doctors had changed. Um, in 1969, again, this was the earliest stages of the self-conscious women's movement, a woman named Nancy Hawley organized a study group at Emanuel College in Boston to explore issues of women's health and sexuality. At the time, she later recalled, there wasn't a single text written by women about women's health and sexuality. This became the Boston Women's Health Collective. 
They created a course on women's health. They created a booklet uh, published by the New England Free Press that sold quickly for 30 cents as, uh, uh, a copy, 150,000 copies. Um, by 1973, they had renamed it Our Bodies Ourselves and had it published with some opposition from the New England Free Press by uh, Simon & Schuster, uh, who's been publishing it ever since. Um, uh, it's been translated into 17 languages and Braille. It sold more than 4 million copies and so forth. At more or less simultaneously um, that the Boston Women's Health Collective was taking off, a divorced New Jersey mother of two young children who Newsweek later called a suburban flop and a failure at golf, tennis, and cooking <laughs> turned out to be a success at writing clear and engaging prose for teens and preteens with an honesty about once taboo topics. Um, uh, Judy Bloom wrote about menstruation, masturbation, teen sex, bodily embarrassments of puberty like wet dreams, unwanted erections, breasts too large or too small, too early or too late, and so on. By 2004, Bloom had published 24 books, almost all for the juvenile market, and they had sold over 75 million copies in 20 languages. Um, she all but invented the, what's called in the publishing biz the YA problem novel, fiction for young adults about serious matters. Um, Chappaquiddick, 1969, um, derailed Senator Kennedy's uh, uh, effort to be president of the United States and was, I think, the, the, the key turning point in making what, by 1968, uh, a, a prominent voice in women's liberation, Carol Hanisch, um, invented the term that personal is political. Um, uh, Senator Kennedy sort of invented it for the rest of us. Uh, because he was not frank about what happened at Chappaquiddick and, uh, and, and yet opened up the importance of personal life and personal actions for political careers. Um, if that wasn't enough, um, Rep Representative Wilbur Mills took care of that five years <laughs> later. Uh, some of you clearly remember uh, uh, his little es escapade that wound up as his car went off uh, the road into the tidal basin in Washington. Uh, he was with um, an exotic dancer, Fanny Fox, um, otherwise known as the Argentine, the Argentine firecracker. Uh, oh, well, anyway, it was not the road, anyway. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but my favorite here, because she's the only theorist I have for all of this, is Betty Ford. Um, Betty Ford's name does not appear in the three histories of the 1970s I've looked at. Um, it does not appear in college U.S. history textbooks. Um, and yet, it seems to me that, that um, she has played a, a terribly important, really important role in American history. Um, you know, in, in the 1950s, people didn't say the word cancer out loud. Doctors didn't say it to their patients. Um, and here she is, September 26, 1974, um, when in a routine med medical exam, doctors found a suspicious lump in her, her breast. Um, four days later, um, uh, she has a radical mastectomy. Uh, and spoke immediately and candidly with the press, um, uttering not just one word, but two that people didn't say in public, breast cancer. Um, <laughs> why did she do it? Uh, well, the, the, she, I don't know. But she did comment on that question to a women's magazine some 10 years later. Uh, and she said, and here's, Here's, here's the theory of my project. Um, she said, there had been so much cover-up during Watergate that we wanted to be sure there would be no cover-up in the Ford administration. So rather than continue this traditional silence about breast cancer, we felt we had to be very public. 
She was not the first woman uh, to speak publicly about breast cancer, but she was clearly the most prominent and the most vigorous in keeping the topic um, before the public. She was not so prompt about talking about her own addiction to alcohol and to uh, prescription drugs. Um, like most alcoholics, she denied she had a problem for years. Her dependency went back to the 1960s, but got substantially worse after the Fords left the White House and returned to Rancho Mirage, California in 1977. In 1978, following a family intervention where her entire family faced her and told her they believed she was an addict and that they had personally suffered from her addiction, she checked into the Long Beach Naval Hospital's alcohol and drug rehab clinic. Um, the rest is history. Um, uh, Betty Ford clinics that she began and that um, you know, for decades um, made her career and her crusade. Um, One or, one or two more, and then I think I'll, I'll stop. Um, oh, let, let, let me just say, say a, a word about why I see her as a theorist. Um, the, the, what, what's, what's, the, what I don't know how to do yet um, is to connect all these things. I have a list, right? I, I, I don't have interactions. Uh, in particular, I don't have interactions between changes in public, governmental, affairs and changes in, uh, in personal life and medical uh, things and sexuality and bodies. How does that relate to the Freedom of Information Act? Um, so far, Betty Ford is my, my best comment that there's a real connection. She looked at, um, at public life, Nixon's uh, uh, stonewalling, Nixon's cover-up, and said, that refers not just to my husband and what he does in the White House, but what I do as First Lady, in, even in my personal, physical, bodily existence. Um, another example, Henry K. Beecher, distinguished anesthesiologist and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. A leader in his field, he was unknown beyond it until 1966 when he published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that detailed the procedures of 22 studies of medical research supported by leading funders, published in leading journals, conducted by faculty at leading universities, all of which treated subjects in ways that endangered their health without their knowledge or approval. This included inducing hepatitis, leaving strep throat untreated and thus risking rheumatic fever, injecting people with live cancer cells to study immunity to cancer. The hepatitis study was undertaken by the chair of pediatrics at NYU and carried out on a population of children at Willowbrook State School for the Retarded. The cancer study was undertaken by researcher Cornell and Sloan Kettering and involved elderly and senile patients. What did Henry Beecher intend to do by writing this article? Well, he wanted to let his colleagues know uh, that there were some dangers in medical experimentation and that they would clean up their own act. Uh, that's what he apparently expected. Uh, he had no sense that there might be some policy implications of all of this. Um, but uh, the article was, uh, came to the attention of NIH, among other places, and led to what plagues all of us uh, to this day if we're studying human subjects. Um, so, you know, talking about downsides of openness, this is a downside. We have all those forms to fill out. Um, but when you look at what they began with, the, the upside seems pretty remarkable. And of course, you know about what happened six years later when, uh, when the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiment was, came out. But another case where I, I actually talked to the reporter who broke that story, uh, Gene Heller, then of the AP, and now at uh, uh, the St. Petersburg paper, uh, uh, I talked with her, and I, I have not talked with the, the whistleblower, but he's an interesting person, I think, Peter Buxton, who uh, had tried for several years. He was a, he was a, a part of the Public Health Service, and a fairly low-level technician of the Public Health Service, but he learned about this experiment that had been going on since 1932 uh, with uh, blacks in 
uh, in the South who, black men with syphilis, and who went untreated even after penicillin uh, was invented and, and came to be a good treatment for syphilis, um, the experiment continued. Uh, and he, he, was, um, he was stonewalled he, by his higher-ups in the public health service. And, um, and finally, in great frustration, he'd started that in his, his concerns in his letters in the mid-60s. Finally, in 1972, he says, I'm going to the media. What I don't know, and I think this would be very interesting to, to learn from him, uh, if I can locate him, um, is why didn't he think of the media in 1966? To which I think I have an answer, which is the media was different by 1972. And the media uh, was a much more aggressive, much more investigative. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, again, these were moments of great change in the news media. Um, at any rate, uh, he, he went uh, to someone in, at the AP office in San Francisco. They passed this on to Gene Heller. Um, who uh, said, you know, I'm, I'm going to make, make my name. This is, I mean, it's all done for me. I mean, I, it's just handed to me. Uh, she didn't have to do any investigation. It had been done. And um, she did think about where she should place it. And this was sort of an interesting bit I got from her on, on the phone. Uh, she said that uh, she wanted it in Washington. She wanted it in, front, in the congressmen's noses. Um, and uh, so there was the... The, the Star or the Post. The Post, in the summer of 1972, seemed obsessed by this weird thing called Watergate. Um, so she went to the Star uh, and made a deal with them, which is they'd have it exclusive uh, for the first day if they could guarantee page one, which they did. And the Tuskegee experiment was closed down within days. Okay. Um, I can go on, but I won't. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to come to a conclusion here. Um, you know, the, there, there are other things to add to this list. I could talk about the Catholic Church and, um, and, and sexual um, uh, assault and, uh, of children in the Catholic Church and other, other things that, you know, all of which was going on in the 1960s uh, and the 1950s, but didn't come out until much more recently. There's a all of this, and 1965, 66, uh, uh, to 1980, seems the, the, the cusp, the moment in which it happens. It, 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 so so I mean, one, you know, the, the next question besides the list is why? Um, and one answer is you know, the, the usual two-word answer, the 60s. Um, and that, I, that's a lot of it, and I don't understand the 60s or know how to explain it. but. Um, uh, I'd say just one last thing, which is that uh, the, the Freedom of Information Act did not come from the 60s. Um, and that m makes me think that there's, there's a, a larger piece of the story. I do have to go back further. The Freedom of Information Act was the, uh, more or less the brainchild of, I'm, I'm feeling very uh, California patriotic today, uh, 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 of John Moss, a Sacramento congressman, who came to the Congress in 1953, um, and one of the first things he did in the, in the Congress was he, you know, he he was the minority party, he was a Democrat then. He was, um, uh, you know, a freshman. He was on you know one of the lowliest committees, civil service and post office, um, and so. But he wanted to defend the Truman, the outgoing Truman administration, and show that the Truman administration had been tough on the commies. Um, how would you show that they'd been tough on the Reds? Well, you could show it by showing that um, that the civil service had dismissed, you know, hundreds of people suspected of being Reds. Uh, so he asked for in employment records from the Civil Service Commission, and they said no. And he couldn't believe it. I mean, it's one thing when he was running the hardware store in Sacramento, but now he was a member of the U.S. Congress, and he could not get information from an executive agency whose money came from the U.S. Congress. Um, and they, they were not budging. Um, thus began a 12-year career um, in trying to get something like what eventually became the Freedom of Information Act. 
So, um, so some of this has to do with relations between one branch of government and another. So the fact that he was successful, I think, has something to do with the Cold War. Um, the Cold War, of course, being the source of so much secrecy in government, but also the source of us, the U.S., identifying ourselves as, um, as the, the stalwart of the free world, the so-called free world. Um, and um, you know, what was wrong with the Soviet Union was secrecy and uh, not sharing information and not having informed citizens and not having elections and so on. We were different. And I think he had, I mean, the, the, he gives a speech at, at one point, is, is there a paper curtain in Washington? I mean, the, the very language that he uses plays off of the Cold War uh, to considerable, I mean, it was slow, but ultimately considerable rhetorical effect. Um, so there, there are more factors in, in, in what goes into this um, uh, than just the 60s, although I'd really like to understand the 60s, too, because, uh, you know, it, it was, it was mind-boggling and, and world-changing, and that, that's something I don't, I, I worry a little for my students, including my graduate students, about the, the overwhelmingness of the internet in their imaginations, um, uh, all of our imaginations. But it, it's, it's sort of like a, the, the sun is too bright, it, it, and we can't see all the stuff behind it. Um, so this is some of the stuff behind it. Yeah, something like that. So I'm wondering how you decide that. And I'm thinking of LBJ raising his shirt to mm. expose a scar, which is, say, vastly different than Kennedy's hidden Addison's right. disease, let alone right. you know, famously Roosevelt's hidden. Um, you know, the, mm -hmm. even though he's so, I mean, because that was one of the, I think, turning points in the question of, and, and, and the Eisenhower uh, heart attacks. I mean, the, right. the whole Which question of what, the, I mean, you're picking Betty Ford as mm -hmm. pushing it beyond the president mm -hmm. sort of in a larger area. But it seems to me there wasn't already a trajectory with LBJ at least. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember when the public articulation of the Kennedy health issue came about. In other words, we should have been told. Mm -hmm. Because that was certainly part of the public discourse at that time, which is that was hidden and it shouldn't have been. Uh, yeah, that, that that's a good point, and I, and I don't know exactly when that was. It might be interesting to look at at the response. My my recollection of uh, of the response to LBJ's was it start. More crude? Yeah, it was yeah. you know he, it was this this. Who wants to know? That's right. But it also wasn't a debilitating. No. Well, but it was a kind of openness. About it. I mean, there's this whole trajectory. You know, it starts with Wilson. Party. I mean, the whole question of you know the health of the president as a public information. Right. Right. And and yeah, I mean, and there there should there should be, and I don't know them. Some some um, you know legislative uh, points of uh, along this you know where where well, when pu is publication the of when is the act about the transfer of power from the presidential that's later than that. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, but it, yeah, it's partly in response to Eisenhower, I think. Yes. Anyway, thank you. Um, just randomly, well, not for me, randomly. I've always thought that the Kennedy assassination changed an awful lot of the psychology of the media and the public mm. with regard to not trusting institutional sources. And that there's a remaining kind of ambiguity, if not distrust, around governmental institutions. And I think that experience, that, that kind of total experience of having to watch this whole event unfold through the ruby of killing of Oswald, and then having this report put together, and, and still I think people are, you know, that lived through that time. I think it was also one of the first times that people of, of my generation uh, 
suspected that America wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam did a, a lot more to, to move this along. But it was really kind of a general change in orientation for what does it mean to be an American? Who are we? Are we really morally and every other way superior to other countries? And should we trust our institutions? So that's just something I would throw in. As right, right. I, I, the, 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 you know, the realizing we're not perfect. Um, has man, many other repercussions, uh, the one of which I, I may, r right now this, this project is, uh, you know, the, the book will have like 75 chapters. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure which I can do and which I can't, but uh, the change in academia in, and in particular the writing of history is enormous and begins, it, it's very much Vietnam um, related. But history from the bottom up, uh, uh, all the people left out of the standard, you know, great white male history, also begins at that time and and changes things a lot. Okay, we have Tom and then you and then Doug and Roberta. So uh, another piece of this is the beginnings of cost benefit analysis and Congress reforms with the Office of Management and Budget. Mm. Mm -hmm. because Congress was kind of in a 19th century uh, style organization under Wilbur. Uh, uh, and I've never traced it, but the uh, executive inspector general could be a, a development relating back to Congress because the power of Congress to develop and monitor modern regulatory organization traces, traces from this period. So that's you know, one of the pieces. Uh, uh, the Inspector General development could be a counterpart as you know, uh, uh, Congress and President continue to try to increase power uh, of their operations. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. The, you know, the, the, they're they're obviously the OMB is very important, and and I I'd, I'd like to know more than I do about how the, how they changed and how um, you know, they, they're their sense of their own domain kept growing in, in these years, but I, I, don't, I don't know what, you know, yeah, yeah, good I mean, sign point. I've, re I've read a lot of the, the quality of their work for this period was very strong uh -huh. and, and uh, uh, very good and related to data from these data, uh, uh, the access to data and think tank information and so, uh, uh, way of modernizing Congress and what's happened to the power of that relation to the Gingrich Revolution is uh -huh. sort of the undoing of regulation. Uh -huh. But the, uh, I've never read the relation between the Inspector General and the OMB. Yeah. That'd be kind of yeah. I'd be interested to know. I'd, uh, just a short thing. The, the act establishing the Inspector General in 1978 was uh, hardly anybody voted against it. I mean, Controlling waste and fraud. I mean, there were like three votes or five votes against. Of course, we'll go. Well, you, you were asking about how to connect these different elements mm. of the story and just to kind of think along with you on that. I wonder if one of the ways is to think about is is to think of an axis of comparison between the different moments: the federal moment and the sexuality moment. And mm -hmm. so, thinking about, for example, the um, you know, an environmental impact statement. Well, usually if you go to a hearing where they talk about it, it's uh, not a hearing. It's, it's, they're not hearing. You know, it's a hearing but not a listening. Uh -huh. And so it's just sort of del deluging the public with information that they can't dispute and can't mm. process. And then there's the possibility of sort of overwhel being overwhelmed with information that, so there's too much and no way to sort through it. And then maybe a third sort of scenario in this question of sort of, okay, so the, the comparison is that the, the axis is about power, like control. So openness is supposed to be about control. Mm -hmm. And so these are all these ways that, that the openness can kind of yield different debates about control. So the third one, the third moment <laughs> is maybe the sexuality moment where, um, okay, you're open, and then the next question was, has been, 
So how much could you have controlled that? You know, is it a choice? Were you born with it? Or is it something you're choosing and can change right. it? So right. all of these openness moments lead to different kinds of public conversations about control and power. And maybe that would be a kind of linking thread. <laughs> OK. Uh, I, I'll, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> I, I, don't have a, I don't have a quick response. It's interesting. Yeah. I was a little bit struck by the trajectory, and there seems to be uh, an effort to kind of find these, these pivotal moments where this shifts happen. I want to get clearly into one of them. Uh -huh. um, I think an earlier one, which maybe is too early, is the Rosenbergs and nuclear secrets. Right? I mean, that, okay. That's a moment of balance where secrecy becomes hyper important. Um, but if, if, even if you follow McCarthy out of that and, and uh, Red Scare stuff, I mean, it, it strikes me mostly about ideas. You know, are you, or, you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Right? It, it's not about um, anything particularly specific. Where post Watergate, it seems that even in your examples, corporeality becomes incredibly important. The body becomes the focus. And even an effort, I think, to Nixon to locate this, the failures in a particular body. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, Nixon is, is the object, not the presidency, not the office, uh, and maybe not even the people around him. Real effort to pin it on the body. And later, as we kind of go along, obviously Clinton's another pretty clear example of corporeality becoming you know, hyper exaggerated and hyper important. So I'm wondering where the body kind of fits in to that discussion. Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's very important. Um, it, uh, and you know, it, and it, in a way, it is, it is more. Bo bodiliness and the, I mean, we're we're supposed to be. I mean, the the, the theory of, of American democracy is we're we're a government of laws, not of men, right, um, or persons. Um, that that's the, the the old phrase, government of laws, not of men. It's never been true, right? Uh, it can't be true. In fact, we're a government of beings. Um, you know that that that's what was so interesting to me in being in a room full of um, you know FOIA officers. That, that they're actual people, <laughs> and uh, and they're either good at what they do or not so good at what they do, or they, uh, but they're 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 people, and um, and so if the Department of Interior finds that um, uh, people in some of their uh, offices making decisions about um, uh, federal projects have been. Um, uh, Selling federal projects for sex, and they were. Um, you know, they, it's another reminder again. Uh, there, there are people uh, with all kinds of, you know, mortal weaknesses um, or features, not necessarily weaknesses, but um, I, I, and so th th that that's, you know, that's right through all of this. At at the same time. Um, like in the Nixon case, the, the, the post-Watergate legislation really tries to take it away from just Nixon. That, I mean, the reason for, for the legislation is, so this should not happen again. And so now Nixon's, you know, he's history. Um, so what do we do so that um, the, the person who happens to occupy an office will not uh, uh, threaten our, our legal system? So, so you, you try to create laws that, that are a kind of institutional memory of this moment, and, and the body part is, is forgotten. Roberto, the gentleman in the back. Yeah, and, uh, and picking up on where you, you just left off in, in my effort to take your Rorschach test and see what <laughs> connect the dots. Uh -huh. But um, I mean, the, the, your list. All of those events seem, in one way or another, to me to be moments of reform, a sense of efforts to to remedy perceived wrongs in one way or another, um, and responding to them with the notion of openness and information as a cure. Um, and um, which is, you know, it, and it's not unique to that period in time. I mean, you look at the progressive era, and there was some of that as well. Yes. Um, you know, I guess that you know the questions to me are, you know, why during this period so much emphasis was put on information as a curative, and maybe what you're talking about in terms of 
differences in the structure of media and information flows help explain why there was such reliance on openness as a tool of reform. Um, and sometimes it's an alternative for reform. Uh, because in, in, particularly in the governmental, um, and even in some of the medical examples you cited, um, information doesn't change the possibility of wrongs. I mean, if anything, um, you look at the inspector general process and its ability to continue to uncover problems shows the problems persist. And, and, um, and we have fresh examples that, that the Watergate reforms don't prevent uh, an excessive concentration of power in the White House, sometimes you know, in, in uh, subversion of the law. Uh, in, in fact, you know, inspector generals can only do criminal referrals or cite violations of procedures. They can't change what's deemed illegal. So in many of these cases, uh, FOIA as well, the campaign contributions as well, the, the openness is not an actual cure. Um, it, it can only be a stimulus to, to further action or to, to action based on disclosure. Um, it's a question of whether, I mean, you look at this either cynically or optimistically. I mean, it's either a substitute for real regulation or it's a belief that uh, openness itself will produce change. Right, no, the, the very helpful comment. Um, yeah, I mean, so, some of these things I'm talking about are reforms. Um, some of them are clearly compromises. Um, it, it, you, you, I mean, um, in campaign finance, you'd really like to be able to limit campaign um, spending. Couldn't limit, you couldn't do that. Um, so, well, at least we can, who, who would be against letting everyone know, um, uh, requiring disclosure? Um, so various forms of warnings on cigarette packages. Why not just you know, make cigarettes illegal? Well, because that's not politically feasible. So then what do you do? Uh, well, you put a warning label on. Um, uh, endless discussions about nutrition labeling and how um, and, and what should be labeled and how should be labeled and where should the label be and whatnot. But uh, uh, you could say, no more Big Macs. Uh, no one's going to say no more Big Macs. Uh, so, so some of, I mean, th this is partly the <coughs> argument of um, Mary Graham in a book called Democracy by Disclosure, that a lot of this is um, a matter of political realism and compromise. So these aren't, it's not great, but it's what we can do. Um, I, I'm, and, and you're right about, you know, you know information, Disclosure by itself doesn't solve the problems. You then have to use that for something. Um, at, at the same time, I, I, yeah, I mean, it may, it may be just a, you know, uh, that I tend to be optimistic. I think you know these things are going to make a difference in the long run. Well, um, there's like more faith in information now. The, there is more faith in information. I mean, the, um, yes, and. Um, and some of this is, uh, I think, partly a product of m maybe an over-enthusiasm in the 60s about participatory democracy. You know, that, uh, and that, that goes back to the progressive era and, you know, we need informed citizens um, uh, to an extent that I, I think is, is uh, mischievous. I mean, that, uh, that is almost as if everything between the individual citizen and the President of the United States disappears. All those organizations, all the, those mediating systems um, uh, disappear. Maybe keep the news media in there uh, somewhere. But um, I, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a mistake of our political imagination. And, um, but it may be a mistake that has led to some of this emphasis on, on information disclosure. Okay. Yes. Um, there's a question that journalism is going to have to help people to deal with in the future. Is it a bad precedent for one administration finding out new information through freedom of information about the previous administration? Would it be vindictive for them to then go and try to criminally prosecute those people? Sort of what's happening now with the change. Or is it not right 
to have an administration just be able to get to January 20th and go out of office and then be home free like a statute of limitation. Right. So I don't know what we're going to have to work that out in the future as we find out more things that Dick Cheney did that we didn't know about. Or, or to seal their own records, as some of the administrations have done. Right, right. I, to seal I, their own records. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think we should be able to know as much as <coughs> possible about you know what the vice president did. I mean that, um, uh, but you know, do you prosecute him now? I, I don't know. I mean, be, beyond what I've thought about, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, I can understand o President Obama's desire to to move on, to put the past behind us, but. I'm, but the I'm, more I'm, we talk about it, I think the more people can start to make up their mind because it's a kind of a general thing that the public would have to right. come down right. on one side. Yeah. Yeah. We have time for two more, two last questions. This gentleman here and Mark. Um, so I wanted to ask, I mean, this kind of age of transparency argument is like immediately compelling. I'm wondering, if, I mean, you were going to be trying to see from the sources of it, how it congealed. And I'm wondering if, if another strategy for study won't be to see when it congealed as a kind of political imagination that's taking different strands that might or might not actually have any relation between them, such as the developments in media, developments in litigation, which I think really mm. have a lot to do with, uh, with doctor-patient interactions, uh, where you can litigate a doctor if he didn't tell you that you had cancer. I mean, that's at least medical sociologists claim that it's one of the huge watersheds in the change. But, but instead of, I mean, so instead of trying to see, uh, well, Betty Ford is making this kind of connection, when does this kind of connection become a political imagination that congeals perhaps very different strands? And that's maybe a different kind of question from the question you're trying to us, but I think maybe it would be unelective. Yeah, it, it might be interesting to look at, at sort of the uh, changes in the use of the term transparency. Uh, I, I know when I started thinking about this three or four years ago, I, I wasn't using the, that term. I was talking about disclosure, um, frankness, whatnot. And someone said, you want grant money? Use the term transparency. <laughs> uh, and uh, so so it, and it has, in, in particular, has a, a kind of global or international uh, uh, cachet that term. But I don't, I don't know where that started or how that happened. But that would be an interesting piece of it to look at any, any of these terms. But that one in particular. Mark, last last question. I'm just thinking that if FOIA officers get really good at what they do, it changes something of what journalists do. Um, and, and I hadn't thought to relate that to the idea that we're in an era where rather than just being adversaries, the power sort of answers to that, there is an increasing move for them to become advocates for different views. And do you have a speculation about whether that could be that sort of part one or part two? Is I, your story to me sounds like an elaboration of the contradictions and the ideas of freedom that we have. So we have you know, freedom of information, what does it look like to free that? We have a free press, we've got the idea that we're a free and open society. And uh, besides Betty Ford, I would think that Friedland and Alford are potentially good theorists for thinking about that, because they talk about, between these different spheres of society, the tensions and contradictions that happen in these institutions that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's a nice way to understand some of what's going on with your list. OK, thank you. Um, uh, I, I've not I've not looked at Friedman and Alford, so I'll give that a, I'll give that a shot. A, lo a lot of this does have to do with, um, I mean, at, at least on the governmental side, with how institutions work, and I'm very interested in learning more about how institutions work. And I hope um, that I'll I'll do some interviewing of um, you know who are these FOIA people and and who are these IGs um, and. Uh, or others in that same kind of very awkward role of having, um, we, we know it from crime shows and, and you know, in, internal, what's it called? In, in internal, police, affairs. internal affairs and in police department. That, um, 
you know, they're in that same kind of very socially, personally difficult position. And again, th these are human beings. It's not just procedures. And how, how do they work that out? Uh, I don't know how much they'll say or how much they... Um, anyway, but I'd, li I'd like to try that out. Um, you said something else I wanted um, to respond to. Oh, d d just a about... The, the the news media, um, I'm, you know, as as anyone concerned about journalism these days, I'm trying to think through how how the hell can we save newspapers, um, and ultimately save journalism since every other part of the news media depends on the Metropolitan Daily newspaper, and um, I I don't know the answer to that question, or or I would tell you, um, but. But I am increasingly struck by how many different news organizations that we don't recognize as news organizations are out there gathering, doing first-hand reporting. That, that's what the inspector general reports do. Um, and, and then sometimes it's not only do we need the media, the news media, to publicize it, but sometimes to follow it up with, with better and more thorough reporting um, and to highlight it in ways that 500 pages sent to the Congress doesn't do. Um, uh, but that we have this huge new uh, ecology of pub public information that and news media is practically the wrong word already. I mean, it's, it's, it's something else. And, um, uh, and worried as I am about the daily newspaper, I'm heartened by all these other NGOs and uh, and bloggers and citizen journalists and this whole unbelievable um, explosion of other sources, more of commentary than the first-hand reporting. But there's first-hand reporting there too. Our speaker next week is uh, Andrew Lakoff. He is going to be from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he's going to be talking on the gen generic bio threat or how we became unprepared. Uh, Chris Weir has asked that I announce that the Civic Engagement Insti Initiative uh, is going to be holding a talk on Wednesday by Mario Diani. He's a professor at the, of sociology at the University of Trento. And the title of his talk is Local Movement Societies, a Network Perspective. It's in Doheny Hall. Uh, room 240 at noon on Wednesday. I have some copies of the uh, handout if you'd like to have more information about it. Michael, thanks for a great talk.